Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we're going to be talking about the chemistry of sunscreen. So during my research for this episode, we came across this specific type of sunscreen, which has a couple interesting things going on. Here it lets us know that it's chemical free, however it also mentions that zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are both used. Now the last time I checked, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are still chemicals. Now the interesting thing here is while they don't have any chemical sunscreens inside the sunscreen, the cap does have a fluorescent compound, which is kind of ironic because uh, there is photochemicals in the cap, but not in the lotion. So the background of sunscreen is that sunscreen works by absorbing harmful UV rays and releasing most of that energy as heat. Now, this is still somewhat ambiguous in the literature, and the rationale for different structural motifs in sunscreen is not well described, but nonetheless, I'm going to summarize what we do know. So there's also physical sunscreens, which are still chemicals, but they uh, are usually metal oxides, including zinc oxide, as well as titanium dioxide. These still absorb most of the light, even though some sources will just say that they reflect them. They actually absorb as much as 95% of the light. So the one thing to note about chemical sunscreens is that they can generate radicals because the excited states of these molecules can transfer energy to other molecules. These molecules could be like oxygen, for instance, making reactive oxygen species, ROS. And when those are generated, something has to be present to scrub them up. And so we're going to be talking about those a little bit later. Here you can see, uh, and you might have seen several other videos on YouTube talking about the looking at the world in UV, for instance. Veritasium has a great video for this, and I'll put a link to his video here. And you can see here that this person's got sunscreen in the shape of a star on their back, and you can see that that's all being uh, absorbed. All, all the UV light hitting their back is being absorbed where the sunscreen is. So what ingredients make a good sunscreen? So the exact... The, uh, Active ingredients shouldn't be absorbed into the skin. So ideally, whatever the active ingredients in your sunscreen are, they shouldn't be something that can be absorbed into the skin. And if they are absorbed, they shouldn't be toxic or should have minimal toxicity. Now, the one thing that's worth noting is that these active ingredients are photosensitizers, as I was just saying, and that means that they're going to produce reactive species when excited with UV light. And so one thing that uh, people who make sunscreens add is antioxidants and most of the time when people talk about antioxidants it's all hype and there's no good evidence to support their use to prevent the formation of radicals or you know chewing up radicals that are formed in the body however in this case because we're generating radicals right on the surface of the skin if you have an antioxidant present it's exactly where it needs to be and so there's a good rationale for why an antioxidant would be beneficial in this case now if you choose different photosensitizers or different active ingredients they uh, could be superior as they might form fewer radicals or fewer um, reactive oxygen species, and then that would be another added benefit, and you might not need as many antioxidants. However, there's also added benefit for having antioxidants in these mixtures, as you want the sunscreen to last a while. So this is just a consideration for consumer products and creams in general. Now, another consideration is that the formula should last for several hours before you need to apply more. You don't want to be applying more sunscreen every 10 minutes, if possible, right? So if the formulation can be created so that this isn't an issue, that's awesome. Now, the interesting thing is that when you're applying a cream, oftentimes the texture matters. If it feels weird, if you feel kind of gross after you put a cream on yourself, you're not going to want to apply that cream. So that's another consideration. Additionally, they will add smells to it so that it's a, a nice smelling product that people will want to use. So it's important to check uh, how long your sunscreen will last in water. Most often, if you're going to the beach, you will be swimming. If you're going to a swimming pool, it's going to be a sunny day. You probably are going to apply some sunscreen. But it's worth noting that some sunscreens will last longer than others uh, when in water. So it's important to choose one that will last and to apply more when needed. So what is a sunburn? There's two types of UV light that make it into the Earth's atmosphere. All of the UVC, which is even higher wavelength, uh, ends up getting absorbed by the ozone, and so that doesn't affect us in this case. But the majority of the light is UVA and UVB. So UVA will just mostly cause damage to the surface of the skin, the epidermis, while the UVB will uh, penetrate deeper and cause most of the damage that we're worried about, including skin cancer, tanning, as well as wrinkles. So when you have a sunburn, it isn't like the light has caused the death it's your cells going oh no we created too many thymine dimers and now we have to commit apoptosis and kill ourselves so that's actually what's happening it's not like the light is killing the cell it's like the light is damaging the dna and then your cell is going okay yeah it's game over we have to nuke the bad cells otherwise 
we're going to get cancer. So it's it's really important that our cells have this mechanism. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the thymine dimers later. So there are several different chemicals in sunscreen. Most often, you'll have multiple different active ingredients in any given product, in any given formulation. And in the United States, the FDA has approved 16 active ingredients, although we typically only see eight or so that show up. When we did a survey of our Discord, a total of 17 active ingredients showed up. But this is because there's people in our Discord from countries all over the world, and there were some that were even exclusive to Australia, which is kind of interesting. So the list of FDA-approved sunscreen ingredients is shown here. We have avobenzene and aminobenzoic acid. All of the orange ones here are just ones that fall as like unique uh, UV blockers rather than falling into a certain class. However, we also have cinemates. These tend to be bad for corals. They have a bad track record for being bad for corals because they can cause bleaching. Although we also have other motifs such as these benzophenones as well as these salicylates. And then finally we can see here's the metal oxides, zinc oxide, and titanium dioxide. Now uh, among the world other ones that have showed up in the survey of our discord include bimotrizinol, which is this triazine. There's other triazines such as this one here, this one here, and this one here. There's also some really odd looking isobenzotriazoles such as this one here and this one here. And to me, this kind of sets off a bit of a red flag because triazoles are known to be allergen sensitizers. Now, I don't know if this applies here, but it's pretty cursed to look at a benzotriazole that's bound through the middle nitrogen in general. We also have some other ones that are, you know, more in more mild looking, such as this benzophenone. Uh, and then we have these interesting looking ones here and here. Now, the interesting thing about uh, this enzacamine is enzacamine was only found in one of the Australian chemicals, although apparently it's also been approved for use in Canada. Now, I've also noted under all of these, as well as the ones on the previous page, that it indicates whether it absorbs UVB or UVA or both. And that's another consideration when you're choosing a sunscreen. So, now I'm going to talk about some of our survey results. So I asked people in the Discord to take a picture of their sunscreen bottles, and I went through and I collected all of the data painfully and slowly. And so you can see uh, there's a couple that are really common, most likely because many of the people in the Discord are from North America. The four most common ones are avobenzone, homosalate, octosalate, octocrylene, um, and then sometimes we have some other ingredients. And so to visualize this, you can see here, you might be wondering why this whole thing adds up to more than 100%. As I mentioned before, there's usually several active ingredients in any given formulation. And so it's just kind of interesting to see that consumer products worldwide have several different active agents. I personally would have thought that there would be like you know, a handful that are showed to be the most robust. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. It's definitely interesting, however. So another member of the Discord, uh, Yipoleb, who I would really like to shout out for all of his contributions to this project, um, he uh, suggested that he could uh, go to this website, um, one of the vendors of sunscreen as well as other products from his country in Austria, and just to use his uh, computer science background to scrape the data. And so instead of spending hours, uh, this only took me about five to 10 minutes after he provided me with this data. And so here we have a sample size of 140 different uh, products. And so you can see uh, there's quite a variety in terms of what products are present uh, in Austria. I would expect that this is a representation of the EU more broadly, as Austria is within the EU. And so you can see there's a lot of different possible reagents that are used in um, in this formulation, which is kind of interesting. Although you'll see that the main four ones from the US, which were shown on this previous slide, um, octocrylene, octosalate, homosalate, and avobenzone are all relatively common here as well, although in slightly lower amounts. So definitely interesting. And there's a couple other more common ones, such as this uh, triazine and this hydroxy uh, hexyl benzoate. It's definitely interesting to see the different makeup from different countries. Now, when we have a UV sensitizer, also known as an active ingredient in the sunscreen, what happens is the ground state is able to get excited to an excited state. And so here you can see this is a singlet state. Um, depending on whether you have a benzophenone or some other photosensitizer, the mechanism of photo excitation and energy release is going to be a little bit different. Now, I couldn't find good literature on the rationale behind uh, choice of certain motifs or certain sunscreen agents other than the wavelength that it absorbs in. Um, so it's worth noting here that once this gets excited, it can also just convert back to the ground state and re-emit the same photons, but that doesn't get rid of the, the harmful UV light unless it emits it in the opposite direction. So most of the time what happens is that energy is transferred to some other molecule. This could be something like oxygen, um, and then some chemistry can happen. And depending on whether 
you have antioxidants present depending on what the specific molecule is. The energy could also be released in the form of heat, although I couldn't find good mechanistic rationales. And so here's one example of oxybenzone. And so the mechanism here that occurs uh, at the interface between the skin and the cream is that it, it's able to oxidize and react with light. And so here you can see we have this dicarbonyl species. This is then able to react as a Michael acceptor, adding in a thiol residue from the skin, forming this Michael addition complex. And so there's some instances where this could react with the skin. Now, I'm not sure whether or not that would be harmful after it's reacted, uh, but that's definitely another possible consideration. And so as I was saying, all active ingredients are photosensitizers. And so you can see oxygen, for instance, is able to get excited to singlet oxygen, which is much more reactive. Singlet oxygen uh, can be quite destructive if you were to breathe in large amounts of it. And so presumably this is only forming in small amounts and photosensitizers that tend to do this are usually not recommended for use in skin cream. And so if this does happen, the radicals uh, that are generated have to get scrubbed somehow, so antioxidants could be used. So you might be wondering what's the difference between triplet oxygen and singlet oxygen. Triplet oxygen is in its ground state. That's like the normal oxygen we breathe. It's pretty chill. However, the singlet oxygen is like ready to do chemistry right away. So it's definitely important to quench that once it's formed or uh, react it and quench it in that sense as well. So there's a lot of chemistry that can happen once the photosensitizer is excited and it definitely should be a concern when choosing uh, sunscreen. And so more research is definitely needed in this area. Okay, so what does UV do to DNA? So we have this one nucleo base called thymine. And so what thymine can do when it's hit with UV light is it can form dimers. Now, once this reaction occurs, we actually have photolyase enzymes, which can undo the process, fortunately. And so if we have small amounts of damage, the cell is able to repair itself. However, if the damage becomes too excessive, the cell will just undergo apoptosis and die so that it doesn't create cancer. And so here you can see these are two possible dimers that can form. This dimer, the cyclobutane, is formed through a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition, whereas here we can see like uh, a radical has been generated on the methyl group, and then that's added into this other alkene of thymine. So it's definitely an interesting process that's worth considering. And it's cool to know that we have mechanisms to uh, detoxify when possible. So what does SPF mean? You see SPF on sunscreen all the time. So SPF stands for sun protection factor. And the number is just one over N of the UV that reaches the skin. So if you have SPF 30, this is one over 30, which is approximately 3%. That means 3% of the UV will reach your skin and it won't get blocked. Now, if you have SPF 50, that means that 1 50th of the UV will reach your skin, which means that 2% of it will still hit your skin. And so even though it seems like there's a big difference between SPF 30 and 50, it's actually only a 1% difference. And so if you had SPF 100, which is twice as strong as SPF 50, that means that 1% of the UV gets through. And so if you're only exposed to small amounts of UV, this difference is really negligible. However, if you're going to spend several hours, uh, it's definitely a consideration. And so you can see, while it might just seem trivial, SPF 30 allows 50% more UV to get to your skin than SPF 50. And so that's definitely one consideration why you might want to go for a higher SPF sunscreen, although the majority of the sunscreen is still being blocked. So wearing any sunscreen at all is better than not wearing any. And even SPF 15 reduces your exposure by 93%. And this will add up if you're in the sun for several hours. So the takeaway from this should be that you should wear sunscreen if you're going to be spending time in the sun. And it's better to wear usually at least 30 SPF 30 sunscreen just to really minimize exposure. And so, uh, so that is all I have to say about that. Now, when we're talking about coral reefs, you might be worried a little bit about certain types of sunscreens. And as I mentioned earlier, certain types of sunscreens are known to bleach coral reefs. And so these typically are cinnamate containing uh, active ingredients, uh, although it's been reported that oxybenzone is also toxic. Although I don't believe it's been banned in Hawaii. If it has, I'd appreciate it if you could comment down below and I will pin your comment. So the sunscreen recommendations, broadly speaking, are if you have lighter skin, you usually will need higher SPF sunscreen because you don't have any natural melanin to absorb some of that UV. And uh, as people tend to have a darker skin tone, this becomes less of an issue, although it's still usually recommended to use SPF 30 sunscreen at least. So hopefully this has been an entertaining and interesting video about sunscreen. It would really help out the channel if you could leave a like and subscribe, and I hope you have a great day.